Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It looks like you're going to have uh, two Colombians side to side. I'm also Colombian. <laughs> so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. So the first question that I already got is, what is a biostatistician doing working in cosmological fine tuning? <laughs> and uh, the answer to that is not actually an math probabilist. And I'm um, interested, very interested in the, uh, what, called, what Paul Davis, uh, well-known physicist, has called the fundamental questions. Uh, in fact, I created even in a you know, program a class on the uh, foundations of machine learning and artificial intelligence and uh, probability statistics and that kind of stuff. And one of the topics in which I'm highly interested is origin of life. So this is coming from that area. And we're going to look again at some probabilistic aspects of cosmological time tuning. This is a uh, joint work with Ola Hosier from the Department of Mathematics of the Stockholm University, uh, Robert J. Marks, who is an electrical engineer at Baylor University, Jason Rao, the former uh, chair of the Division of Biostatistics here in some parts, and uh, Kadri Matthew, who is a very smart high school student who is working right now with, with us too. So, uh, Basically, I'm going to divide this talk in five, in five parts. One, first, I'm going to explain what is fine tuning in order to talk about the probabilistic aspects that uh, involve fine tuning. We're going to see that there are some riddles and some difficult questions to answer in terms of how to measure the probabilities of what it's called a life permitting intervals for the constants of nature. And then, my research basically, what it has focused on is in developing algorithms and uh, models, mathematical models, to uh, get rid of those problems. And then we are going to look at some examples, the critical density of the universe, the constant of gravity, the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations. But then we are going to uh, see that in some instances, it's kind of doubtful if we are really reaching some conclusion. So independently of this project, actually, we. My colleagues with Sunil Rao and with Ola Hosier, we developed a theory of learning and knowledge acquisition, which is kind of a mathematization of uh, philosophical questions in epistemology. And we use the probability and information theory in order to model that uh, learning, that theory of learning and knowledge acquisition. And in the end, then we are going to apply what we have done on fine tuning to the principles of learning and knowledge acquisition to see if actually we can learn something about cosmological fine tuning. I had the initial hope of extending this to some things that we have also done in terms of biological fine tuning, but it's not going to come. I'm not going to have enough time to do that in one hour. So let's start. What is fine tuning? What is cosmological fine tuning? Well, cosmological fine tuning was a problem that started in the 70s, in the previous century. Uh, with a cosmologist, uh, his name was Brandon Carter, and Brandon Carter uh, realized that some constants of nature must pertain to small intervals, or actually to intervals of a small probability, in order for life to exist in our universe. And that's what he called the anthropic principle. Later, uh, there was a book called uh, uh, something like the anthropic principle, I'm forgetting the name right now, but they changed the definition and they put something that's saying that constants of nature are or have a small probability in order for life to exist. So there is some change in the way that it was phrased, implying that actually the uh, universe has these narrow intervals and these narrow probabilities for the life permitting intervals so that life could exist. We are not going that far. We are taking the weak anthropic, the weak definition of the anthropic principle, and we're going to work with that. Now, what happens in physics usually? The constants of nature are actually the parameters of the physical models. The two main physical models are the standard model for particles and the standard model for cosmology. And then those constants of nature are going to be the parameters of those models. And that sets us in a setting which is very well known for the statisticians because the statisticians usually work with mathematical models that have parameters in order to measure if uh, they are uh, relevant or not. 
And now, let me finish this session by saying that constants of nature are not only or necessarily working by themselves, but they can be working also in interacting between them. So that some of those constants necessarily need to interact again in small intervals so that life can exist. And uh, some people also consider initial conditions uh, as part of what is uh, fine tuned. Now, what is the situation? Also, some physicists have said that in order to have a, a fine tuning, that is the fine tuning of the constants of cosmology for uh, intelligent life or for carbon based life at least, the only thing that matters is the size of the interval. But uh, we're going to show here that actually probability is much more important. And that in order to determine if, if there is fine tuning or not, we need to find actually if the, pro, uh, the probability of the life from it needs to And then, without information about probability, it's going to be impossible to determine whether the tuning is going to be fine or close. So, we really need to take the approach, the probabilistic approach, in order to determine if there's going to be fine tuning or not. Now, the problem with the probabilistic approach, as several people in physics have acknowledged, is that, well, there are lots of problems. One of those, the one that started our research, is called the normalization problem. The normalization problem is basically the impossibility to apply Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason, or the same thing, Laplace principle of indifference, which says that in the absence of any additional knowledge, we should use a random variable that is uniformly distributed. The intuition behind that, even though Bernoulli and Laplace came many times or much time before it was uh, formally uh, developed, is that the uniform has a maximum entropy in a finite space. The problem, however, is that the constants of nature many times may range over infinite intervals or over infinite spaces so that we don't have a uniform distribution. And then uh, some philosophers, actually this citation is pertaining to some philosophers of science who have criticized how physicists are uh, uh, using uniform probabilities in order to measure that, that those probabilities. I think that that criticism is right. The second criticism that has been right and is more important is the weak entropic principle. And in simple words, we could put it as um, it's a problem in selection bias. You know, in universe, we are talking about the unique, unique, unique universe, unique world where we live. So our sample size is one, and the sample is biased because we happen to live in a universe that, of course, permits life. We're here. So uh, that's why it's called the weak entropic principles. Basically, the selection bias problem that we live in a universe that permits life. Now, um, in order to work with maximum entropy distributions more general than the uniform one, again, the same Magoo from the first article uh, criticized the use of a unique uh, maximum entropy distribution in order to determine if um, the constants of nature are finely tuned. And there is another problem that was initially, at least to my knowledge, um, posed by uh, Keynes, the famous uh, economist. Well, Keynes also wrote a famous treatise in probability with uh, working on the foundations of probability. And one of the things that uh, one of the examples that he provided in his uh, 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 treatise on probability was this example of a uniform distribution such that when we change the space, when we transform the space, and we use a new random variable for that space, then the random variable that we are transforming into the new space, even though it's finite, is not uniform. So the problem with uniform distributions is that they are not invariant to transformations of the space. So uh, that has been actually a roadblock in order to use maximum entropy distributions as baselines or as null hypotheses in general, in statistical analysis in general. And in fact, taking that example from Keynes, um, Jeffries came after him and he developed his famous prior, which is in many cases not even a probability distribution, to solve the problems of the lack of invariance of maximum entropy, of uniform distributions and maximum entropy distributions in general. So this is 
a sample of four big problems that the measurement of fine tuning has up to this point. It's it's a probability. It must be related to the fact that the meaningful macro scales are not dependent on the observer. Uh, in some sense, but at least, so that actually leads me to another important point. I'm not focusing much. So, okay, fine tuning has two sides, two legs. The first leg of fine tuning is physical, or at least pertaining to physics, which is the determination of the parameters, the constants of nature of interest, and the life orbiting intervals. And the second problem, and that's why I'm not going much into that part, is the mathematical problem of determining what is the probability of the LPI. So basically what I'm doing is just working with uh, uh, whatever LPI, a life permitting interval, physicists are providing, and we are measuring if that probability is large or if it is not. And we are going to say, actually, that there is fine tuning if the probability of that life permitting interval is small for that particular constant. So um, in a sense, yes, it is related to to macro states in physics. And actually, uh, if you think about it, most of the concepts in probability and statistics are coming from physics. Name as density, uh, moments, and all that kind of stuff is actually coming from them. And uh, limiting distributions are actually, again, uh, the entropy, the limiting maximum entropy distributions in, in macro states. But again, I'm not going much into that part. I'm just focusing on the statistical part right here. So, in order to solve those problems, we developed an algorithm. Or something that we might think as an algorithm, because I think it's simpler to uh, see in that way. The algorithm is going to have three inputs. First, the sample space of the particular parameter that we are looking at. And believe it or not, this thing that looks so simple and so trivial, and that usually probabilists and statisticians and everybody just Okay, we have this sample space, let's work with uh, the relevant distribution. This is really important here, because this is at the core of the criticism of normalization. What is the relevant space so that we can actually work with some uh, meaningful distribution for that is supported in that space? The second is that we need to impose constraints on the, mainly on the moments of the distributions, uh, because if we have Again, uh, sample spaces of infinite size, well, we need to impose restrictions in order to have maximum entropy distributions. For instance, we know that in the whole real line, uh, the normal distribution is a maximum entropy distribution, provided that we know the mean and the variance. So among all distributions with a given mean and a given variance, variance then the normal distribution has maximum entropy. But we need to impose final momenta. For, uh, for maximum, for, in order for the maximum entropy to be a normal distribution, yes. They yeah, have of to the normal distribution already. Most distributions may not even have final momenta. Uh, 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 yeah, some of those not. Kurtos is a Kurtos. Well, Kurtos is actually imposing higher, higher moments. Well, Kurtos is actually four moments. It's uh, requiring the existence of the fourth moment. This no, no, that's what I mean. You can imagine a situation in which the, the, in the space of probability distributions is large enough that most distributions will not be done. Yes, of course, of course. So, but anyhow, if the space has infinite size, either if it is discrete, discrete and uh, has a, a cardinality infinity, or if it is uh, continuous, and it has direct measure infinity, then we need to impose restrictions in order to have maximum entropy distribution. If not, if not, we're not going to find it. The only case in which we cannot not have uh, any uh, uh, restrictions if our space is finite, in which case we don't know anything, and then we can assume safely that maximum entropy distribution is going to be the uniform distribution. Okay, but if not, we need to impose restrictions. And the third thing that we need to know is the LPI, the life probability interval. So again, I'm assuming that physicists are providing us with that information, and then we are going to use that in order to uh, present some probability. So what is this algorithm going to do with uh, these inputs? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to find a family of maximum entropy distributions 
that correspond to the restrictions and the space that we gave as inputs in steps one and two. And the second thing that we are going to do is that we are going to look over the whole family of distributions. And we're going to calculate the probability of the life permitting interval for each member of that family. And then we are going to maximize it. So basically, we are going to use this TP max, the maximizer of all the probabilities of the life permitting intervals, as the estimator of the probability of the life permitting interval in the cell. Now, if the probability of if this TP max, this tuning probability is small enough, then we will conclude that the parameter is fine tuning. And if it is not, oops. So that's given the constraints. That's given the constraints, and of course, we are going to touch on that later. And uh, then, if not, if this uh, probability, if this, if this tuning probability is large, then the procedure is going to be inconclusive. So yes, as you were saying, that's given the constraints. And then, before going to that point, we actually have a little theorem to show how uh, find these probabilities, at least in some cases. There are many still, many open cases yet, but let's assume, for instance, this is basically a theorem and it's summarizing this table. So what is this table telling us? Suppose that we have then our uh, parameter, and that the parameter can only live in the positive reals. That's, for instance, if we have the density of the universe, or that's, for instance, if we have uh, 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 the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations or something like that. Those things cannot be negative, so the parameter naturally is going to be non-negative. Then, in that case, if we consider as the family of interest uh, a scale family of distributions, you can think of that, for instance, with a good representative, it's going to be the exponential distribution, in which the parameter, the hyperparameter of the exponential distribution is actually a positive number, if the life permitting interval has size uh, epsilon, which is very small, then the tuning probability is actually going to be directly proportional to the size of the interval. In other cases, for instance, when we are considering formal scale in R plus, that is, for instance, the case with variable distributions or with gamma distributions, then we're going to have two parameters, one corresponding to form and one corresponding to scale. And if we don't impose any restriction, then actually the, the tuning probability is going to be one. So we are not learning anything. Now, if we impose some restrictions, like for instance, the signal to noise ratio, that is the square of the expectation over the variance, or at least the square of the uh, form parameter over the scale parameter, not necessarily uh, the linear variance. And if that thing is bounded by some t, and t satisfies some other properties, then again, we can say that the tuning probability is going to be uh, directly proportional to the size of the interval. Well, we have results like that when uh, the parameter might be any real number. For instance, and let me just point this, this case, the scale family. What can we consider the scale family, or what scale family of distributions over, over the real line? Imagine that we have a normal distribution that is centered around zero. So the mean is zero, and we are only varying the variance. Then we only have one parameter, which is the variance. And in that case, then, if the life permitting interval is not including the mean, and the size of the interval is small enough, then again, the tuning probability is directly proportional to the size of the interval. If zero is actually, uh, if the mean is included in the life permitting interval, then the tuning probability is going to be one. Just to mention one, one situation, but we have others as you will see. But then you're saying that these are not even like university classes. I mean, they are universal. I mean, for the for the set for the families F in that case, for the families F, and then that's actually leading me to the second part is how can we learn, or if we can learn actually if there is fine tuning, or no if there is fine tuning. But before going there, let me just present some examples. Okay. So, I said before, let me go back here, that for the scale distributions over the whole, for the scale, the scale family of distribution over the real line, if we have only, uh, if we have that the mean is inside the life permitting interval, is outside the life permitting interval, then the, the tuning probability is small. But if not, 
then this is one. Why is this happening? Let me explain with this situation, with this example of normal distribution. So assume that that distribution is a normal center at zero. So mu is zero in this example. And then the life probability interval is uh, containing the mean. Since we are varying the variance, then as we make the variance small, then more and more probability is concentrated in the life probability interval. So in the end, if the mean is inside the life probability interval, varying over all the possible normals, I'm going to have that that thing in the end is, has probably one. On the other side, if my life probability interval does not contain the mean, then it doesn't matter, actually. Well, I know for sure that actually the tuning probability is going to be smaller than one. Why? Think about the variance of this distribution going to zero around the mean. So that's basically going to give us a derived point uh, distribution, which has probability one in the mean, and then zero in other places. So clearly, that would be a function in that case. On the other hand, if the distribution goes to infinity, then again, if the variance so it goes to infinity, then again, the probability of this interval is going to zero. So clearly, clearly, what we get here is that if the life probability interval is not containing the mean value or the location value in general, then uh, this tuning probability is going to be smaller than y. So this is showing us something that I was mentioning before. The first thing that it is showing us is that actually we can have very small intervals with a large probability. So contrary to what some physicists have been saying, actually, well, if we have small intervals, we can still have large probability. And uh, uh, again, we can have actually very large probabilities of infinite size. If you think about the details of a normal distribution, that are going to have negligible probabilities, even if they have infinite size, infinite direct measure. So then that just show us once again, and definitely I think that fine tuning can only be determined by the probability and not the size of the intervals. In fact, we have a paper, and the name for the paper is uh, Sometimes Size Does Not Matter. And uh, this is what we are finding here. The size doesn't matter. What matters is the probability. So... And this, yeah, this is part of this non-invariant transformation. Once you have the... Once you pick this normal distribution, if, if you did a diffeomorphism of the interval, then it would affect the probability. Yes, exactly. So, but notice what we have achieved at least at this up to this point with this kind of algorithm, with this algorithm, and with this uh, method that we have proposed to measure the probability. First, the normalization problem is solved because we are not considering only finite sample spaces. Finite again in terms of either. Uh, uh, Cardinality or Lebesgue measure. Then we are solving the weak anthropic principle too, because we are not looking particularly. So again, just actually by considering this whole family, this four point, considering a whole family of maximum entropy distributions given the restrictions, then we are actually just putting the real distribution inside the family so that we are. If the tuning probability is small, then it is including, is bounding actually at the real tuning probability. So if that thing is small, then again we are solving the, the weak entropy principle. Now, the lack of invariance of maximum entropy distribution is solved, and this I should put some kind of uh, comment here, because this is, at least for now, intuition, but this is something that we want to work on. And the reason for this is that actually if this family is large enough to include the transformations of the random variable, then actually, if this tuning probability is small, then we are saying that the transformations don't matter much. And that would be huge in terms of, again, producing invariance or being able to work with invariance of the transformations of uh, uniform and general maximum entropy distributions. And uh, the other thing is, of course, that the problem of unique maximum entropy distributions is solved because we are working with a whole family of maximum entropy distributions. And now, do you think you can add at the same time 
just to understand that P is a large family of public distributions. Uh, and not be uniform for something like that. Uh, well, we're not working with uniform. Actually, nothing no, 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 that no, implies that we're working with uniform distribution. In the finite case, that would be the obvious. Yeah, in the finite case, that would be the obvious case. And I'm still looking, you know, I'm very interested in seeing if there's some actual case in which we can take a finite sample space so or for that parameter. And I have not found any example that I that I can say that it is appealing. Again, I say physicists have worked with that. Luke Barnes, who is one of the main figures in fine-tuning physics, have published some papers using the uniform distribution, even though he, and particularly for, for the gravitational law, even though he previously said that he, we could imagine the gravitational law being uh, not only attractive, but repulsive, so viewing the possibility of the gravitational uh, constant to be negative. Uh, Max Tegmark, a very famous physicist at MIT, have also uh, uh, used the uniform distribution and actually even Roger Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize two years ago in physics, have uh, used uniform distribution in order to show that actually the initial entropy of the universe, that I don't have this example here, but that is quite stunning because he found that using the uniform distribution that the initial entropy of the universe must be something of, on the order of 10 to the 10 to the 123. That's right. That is a discretization of the space that I don't know if it's justified. But actually one of the things, as, as an aside comment, that I, that I believe if that can be actually done with rigorous math, you know, any time that I see those things, I remember a book of mathematician with the word on random graphs. And he says, well, the problem with, between mathematicians and physicists is that we mathematicians are suffering every time that physicists are doing some mathematical operation because if they don't like a term, they just chop it off. <laughs> and then we are like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then we keep all the time trying to justify the steps that they are doing <laughs> just because. <laughs> uh, but then they have the advantage of just by doing that, being very fast in whatever they are producing. And we know that mathematics is actually working very slowly with it compared to that. So, so, but you could abdicate something different. You could abandon maximal entropy. You could, uh, if you abandon maximal entropy and you just say, well, I want a very symmetric distribution or something like that. Yeah, 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 that's a, 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 that's a possibility as long as you can justify. So what is the point with maximum entropy distribution? The point with maximum entropy distribution is that they are, as James, who was the guy who developed the theory of maximum entropy distribution. Maximum entropy, I mean, in terms of information theory, yeah. not in terms of thermodynamics. Mm. James, when James developed this, uh, uh, he was thinking on the maximum entropy distribution being uh, maximally non committal to put it in his words. So there is, that is the most unbiased assumption that we can make. Other things are actually going to introduce some kind of information that maybe is not that justified. So that is the safest. So we can use other distributions, but then we would need a strong reasons in order to go for those distributions. You don't have this one. For example, for this value, statistical estimate for the initial entropy, it is conceivable that you have as part of the cosmological model uh, an estimate that says yes, it's about the order of magnitude the entropy, the initial entropy. So you would, you would say, well, then yeah, it was okay to take this not maximal entropy with all analysis of the law of the planets. Maybe I will have. Uh, so again, this is the case. Okay, even on the same space. Under different restrictions, yeah. maximum entropy distributions are going to be different, even over the same space. Yeah. So if we have good reasons in order to change from one maximum entropy distribution, because we have additional conditions, what I would do is to look for a maximum entropy distribution according to the new conditions that I'm obtaining. So it's not going to be the same maximum entropy under the previous set of conditions that I had, but a new maximum entropy distribution under the new set of conditions that I have. That's, what I, that's how I would think about it. Any other way than that, um, I am skeptical, and I think on the other side that reviewers are not going to like that much. 
uh, neither for papers nor for grants, to be honest, uh, in, in, in that aspect. Uh, because I don't know how to justify that. Again. It's just, uh, then I would fall in what I think physicists are doing, which is just, okay, let's use a yeah, uniform distribution just because uh, we think we can use it. We are giving some uh, foundational reasons in order to use them. Uh, well, let me continue. The, this criteria actually is good in the sense of not allowing for false positives. Because anytime the turning probability is small, actually we can be sure that the real distribution is giving us some small probability too. But it does not do well in terms of false negatives. Because when the tuning probability is large, well, we don't know what is the real probability. The real probability can be low or large, and we cannot know. So uh, the criteria is good to avoid false positives, type 1 errors, but it's not good to avoid type 2 errors. Let me now jump to the examples of how we use this. Uh, physicist Paul Davis have said some time ago that the critical density of the universe is uh, uh, taking values in this very small interval of the value of the constant and in the times uh, for the low uh, limit of the interval, 1 minus 10 to the minus 60. And for the upper uh, limit, 1 plus 10 to the minus 60. And he's saying that above that level, then life would not be possible. This is basically because this uh, uh, critical density of the universe is measuring the rate of expansion of the universe, basically. And if the universe were expanding too uh, uh, rapidly, then uh, particles would not have a way to collide, the stars would not form, galaxies would not form, and then we would not have any carbon in order to form life. So uh, this interval is clearly small. So in this case, we can assume that epsilon is this 10 to the minus 60. And since we are talking about the critical density, that density cannot be negative. So we are going to assume that the space, the relevant space, is the non-negative real numbers. Now, if we apply the three sets of criteria that we have, then we're going to find that for some kind of distribution that belongs to the scale family, that probability is actually very small. So there is fine tuning for that case. And when we have distributions that involve form and scale, so two parameters, actually then we need to impose additional restrictions in order to uh, find fine tuning. If we don't impose any restriction for distributions of the form of form and scale, uh, of the family of form and scale distributions, then we are going to find that the maximum probability is one, so we can determine it in that case. The second example is a little bit more interesting, interesting because again, using observations from all days, uh, we are going to look at the gravitational force. But the gravitational force is usually looked at in comparison to other uh, uh, constants of nature or to other parameters. For instance, in this case, we are going to compare the observed gravitational constant over the observed uh, or the contribution from vacuum energy to a cosmological constant. And then Paul Davis has said that that ratio must be inside this small interval of relative size 10 to the minus 100 in order for life to exist again. That is a very small number. If you think about moving this constant out of that interval, then uh, uh, we would be, we would not be here if that's the point, if the real body of the parameter were outside of this uh, interval. Now, if the gravitational force is only attractive, then we are in the same case as before. And then, just as we did, the same analysis, but changing 10 to the minus 60, now by 10 to the minus 100, we will obtain the same conclusions. But, if gravitation can be repulsive, then actually we have to think of the parameter as belonging to the whole real line. And in that case, then, uh, it's very interesting that clearly this interval is not containing the zero value. So for a family of normal distributions which is centered around zero and varying variance, then actually you're going to obtain again that there is some term here. Uh, again, no, for... because the prior says that again all things being equal, they are practically impulsive. Yeah. All things being equal, it makes sense just to put the, 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 the mean in, in zero. 
that's actually one of the points of my colleague Ola Hosier, you know, to consider that zero distribution, that zero uh, mean and normal distribution in that case. Which makes sense. And the last example is another situation that we found very interesting because actually there is a famous book by Martin Rees called uh, Just Six Numbers. And he's considering those six numbers as finely tuned. And one of those numbers is the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations. And as I said before, when they are amplitude of waves, basically, so we must think about those things as non-negative. So the parameter Q, as it's called, the, the, the parameter, is non-negative. But in this case, what they are saying is that actually the uh, life permitting interval is this thing, involving two orders of magnitude. So uh, since epsilon actually in this case is large because we are going beyond uh, the same order of magnitude actually, then what we have said for small epsilon doesn't work. But still, we can assume for this case that we have, a, for instance, an exponential distribution. And then we can maximize the tuning probability of all the exponential distribution. And in this case, what we find is that the tuning probability is around 0.7, which is very large. So that thing to me doesn't look at all like fine tuning. So following your set of questions now, mm, I don't know how much time I have. Okay, okay. So following the, the set of questions that basically tuning probability, as you have seen, depend heavily on the assumptions that I'm making. So on the space, on the restrictions, and on the state, then I started to wonder if this could be something like one of those no-go theorems in which well, we cannot find anything useful. And I was thinking in putting this in terms again of undecidability, so making it look like an algorithm in which I could apply something similar to a Turing test and uh, find some conclusion. And then I just realized that last year, with my colleagues who published this paper on, on, on learning and knowledge acquisition, a formalization on how to know if we are learning or acquiring knowledge. So let me go a little bit into this. Philosophers say that uh, knowledge is justified through belief. So in order to know something, for subject, for a subject S to know if a proposition P is true, or then the subject has to believe in the proposition, that's the part of the belief, the proposition has to be true, that's the true part, and then S belief about P, S belief about P must be justified, and that is the part of the justified. And by justified, they mean believing it for the right reason. So uh, again, then, a subject S is going to know if a proposition P is true, if the subject believes in the proposition, if P is true, and if the belief is uh, justified. Only the two first properties are satisfied, S believes in P and P is true, then we will say that S learns P, which is kind of weaker. So what we see is that knowledge is actually uh, a smaller subset than learning, and learning is a smaller subset than belief. And actually, these uh, congenances are proper. These uh, subset relations are proper. So it's, pro it's possible to believe something that is false, and it's possible to learn something without knowing it, according to the definitions of this. So OK, this is on the philosophical side. How are we going to do to formalize this mathematically? Well, in order to formalize it mathematically, we're going to take an approach from information theory and probability and statistics. And we're going to think about uh, a parameter and a set of possible words, which is the values that the parameter can take. We're going to assume that in the true world, there is actually some actual value of the parameter. So that is a frequentist assumption in the statistical terms. And that real value is actually including the set of possible words. And all the other possibilities are going to be counterfactual. Now, the proposition, in the way that we are defining it, is going to be either true or false. That, again, is a frequentist assumption. But this is going to be either true or false depending on the value of the parameter, so depending on the word that we are considering. So this is going to be a binary uh, function taking values in 0 and 1, 0 if it is false, and 1 if it is true. 
and then we're going to consider the set of all the possible words in which the proposition is true. Now, with that setting, then, we are going to assume a baseline probability that in the set of words that is true, is going to assign a belief according to what Bayesians usually do. Bayesians actually call probabilities just beliefs. Uh, and in an ignorant agent is going to assign them the probability P0 of A uh, to the, to the uh, proposition P. That's a belief that he's going to assign, he she, the agent in general is going to assign. In most cases, that P0, again, is going to be a maximum entropy distribution because the ignorant agent doesn't have any reason to apply any other uh, uh, distribution, but in some instances, it might not be. Now, we're going to consider some agent that with additional information is actually transforming that probability, again, according to a posterior probability. So that is also an Bayesian assumption. So what we have then is that P0 is a probability measure on the measurable space omega G0, where uh, G0 is usually the minimum sigma algebra uh, in case, uh, well, no, in general, it's going to be the minimum sigma algebra. And in case, again, omega is finite, either, again, discrete or continuous, and you have measure, then P0 is going to be in the Now, P is going to be a probability measure over the same space, but with a different sigma algebra. And this sigma algebra is actually going to be finer because what the information is providing us is a way to measure more events than what we had before. So we can think, actually, of the sigma algebras of the two spaces as the level of discernment that we have. Then we're going to define learning. Remember that we said that learning happens if uh, the proposition is true. Uh, and, uh, and S believes in P, in the proposition. So what is this saying? This definition is saying that there's going to be learning if the proposition is true. And if the belief of A of the agent increased with new information with respect to that of the ignorant person. Or, actually, if the proposition is false and the belief of the agent decreased uh, with respect to the belief of an ignorant person. That is how we define learning. Now, knowledge is going to require more. Knowledge requires that the belief is actually justified, that the learning is justified. So how are we going to justify that? Well, we need to know, actually, that the real, the value of the true world is in the support of the probability measure. And then, this is just saying that the support is the, the, uh, the true world being the support of the probability measure is just assuming that for all open both centered around the true world in the set of possible words, then uh, that thing is going to have positive, the ball that is containing that point is going to have positive probability. So, uh, the third requirement is actually that for the closed ball that I can form, for all epsilon centered at W0 at the real world, then uh, my belief in that, in the real value of the parameter is increasing with respect to that of the ignorant person. And this must be actually a strict inequality for some epsilon. So in all cases, it must be, for all epsilons, this must be bigger than or equal to zero, but there must be some epsilon for which yes, that inequality is switch. And if that happens, then we must jump from learn, we can jump from learn to knowledge. So let me just explain what that definition of knowledge is saying. So the first condition warrants that knowledge is more stringent concept than learning, because it's including learning as part of it. And the second condition then requires that the true world is among the pool of possibilities of of the subject. And the third condition, what it is doing, is that it warrants that the belief in the true world under P is actually stronger than under uh, the ignorant case. So this is all done using this logarithm of the probability of the posterior over the prior, which we call active information. And of course, as uh, then in order for this thing to exist, the measure P has to be absolutely continuous with respect to P0. And well, just by continuity, a lot of 0 is 0 is 0. Just to let me write a little bit about it, we have used, we use this measure of active information in a lot of settings, search problems in machine learning with my colleagues. 
my colleagues and I actually in the world these days have developed all my developed things that I have done. In biological fine tuning, I have worked in genetics, I have worked using active information, cluster detection, machine learning, I have used it, correction detection of COVID-19, testing measures too, and hypothesis testing, I have worked with using data and measure of active information. Now, let me just finish saying that we can learn that tuning is actually happening. And let me start with a simple example, or with a simple situation. Let's consider the proposition that our universe permits life, which is clearly true because we are here. But let's look at it as an example. So the proposition is that if the tuning probability is smaller than one, then we can learn that our universe permits life. So how are we going to do that? In order to prove that thing, it's very simple. What we're going to do, basically, is just to equate the set of possible words in learning with the set of possible values of the parameter. So that the observed value of the constant is actually the real value of uh, the, the value of, in the real world in the context of learning. So the set A of the true values of the parameter coincides with the life permitting interval. So if P0 represents the belief on a, of an ignorant agent, as we were saying before, then P0 is going to have maximum entropy among the distribution with the given restriction. So actually, the probability of A under zero is going to be the same probability of the life of an interval in the denominator. And that probability is going to be bounded up by the maximum that we found before in the algorithm, which is just the tuning probability. As for the numerator, then well, we can be sure that we live in a universe that harbors life because we have that kind of data. <laughs> we are here. So uh, that probability becomes just a director at that point. So uh, what we obtain is then that the active information is going to end up being bounded by this thing, where this is one. And then if TP max is less than one, if the tuning probability is less than one, then we can learn that uh, our universe harbors life or permits life. Notice that we don't need fine tuning in order to do that to detect this. Constants, even like we saw like the uh, uh, like the tuning probability of the primordial fluctuation, which is very large, is still going to be smaller than one. So this law is going to be bigger than one. Can I really be confused by something just a little Maybe I don't really understand. It's just slightly circular, doesn't it? Uh, because we know that the universe covers life. It's your definition of knowing. Yeah. Uh, but then we just show something weaker that we can learn that the universe covers life. It's just, and we use the fact that we know that thing is one. So the ignorant person, actually, well, this is very interesting because when I was writing this example, I was thinking that there are some philosophers who actually, uh, they really doubt that we exist or something, some crazy things like that. <laughs> but I would, we can say that with posterior, we can take the informa that information that we know that we are as posterior, as more data. So that is giving us the posterior probability. Yeah, yeah, but this one data, is the answer, isn't it? It's the answer, of course, that is the answer. That is the answer. So this is also showing us that this criteria is good when it's detecting that we can say that we learned something, but it's good to avoid false positives, but if, again, this same criteria of learning might be some uh, 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 limitations in terms of false negatives, just as the other criteria, actually. Just like that. So that's a good point, actually, and that's something that I realized while I was writing this example. So that's a very good point. So yes, then, just a simple corollary is that, uh, again, if TP max is smaller than one, then we know, we can learn that the, the, the constant is fine tuning. Uh, that, sorry, we can learn so we that. We don't learn fine tuning. No, 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 we don't, that's a mistake. That's a typo here. We learn that the universe has both sides. This that's is a typo. I, I, this is something that. Yeah, yeah, this is not true because yeah. the seven thing satisfies all these conditions. The proposition that we are considering here is that our universe of that our universe has both sides. The example you have with two orders of magnitude that was 0.7 in the probability. Yeah. Uh, that's not fine tuned. That's not fine tuned. So that is this proposition. Yes. So we can know, even with that thing, uh -huh. that our universe from its side. I mean, this is that's kind of the way. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that is a trivial example, but I'm just using it for, for the purpose of illustration. Because the one that I actually want to go to is that the universe is fine tuned for life. Okay, so the previous proposition is that the universe permits life. And the one that is actually of interest to us is that the universe is fine tuned for life. So for that proposition, actually, 
we have to consider a different set of possible words. And in order to do that, then we are going to consider this probability space. What is this probability space? This probability space is actually the real probability distribution that the random variable that is determining the constant of the universe is going to use. And that probability distribution is going to be in the measurable space, omega prime, uh, and, uh, and G sub theta prime, where omega prime is the sample space, and G sub theta prime is the uh, 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 sigma algebra. So if this sigma, if the space is finite, this sigma algebra is going to be the more general one, which is the set of all subsets. And if the space is continuous, then this sigma algebra is going to be the model sigma algebra. So the, then you are in the, the theta prime is a space of probability distribution. Yeah, uh, no. This theta prime, uh, this theta prime is the state, the real support of the parameter, the physical parameter. Okay, this is okay. the support of the parameter. Okay. Yeah. And you have a sigma algebra the support. On the support of the parameter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we are assuming that, and then. Uh, we are going to assume. Yeah, that's the probability distribution that we're going to assume for that sample size. So the real one is going to be this P, uh, I don't know, mass BB. I don't know how to put it in terms of like mm. uh, So we are also going to assume that there is fine tuning. We want to learn if there is fine tuning. So let's assume that there is fine tuning. Fine tuning is going to be there if the probability, the real probability, of the life permitting interval is small. So we're going to make an additional assumption here. And we're going to suppose that, and we're going to see that actually this is not needed in order to learn fine tuning, but this is needed in order to know if there is fine tuning. But we're going to assume here that this P, the real probability, is actually in the class of probability distribution that we're going to use. Now, and this class is determined by the constraints. This class is determined by, by not this one very interesting thing, because now we want to look at this probability, so we are going to work with this probability as the parameter. Now, in the case of learning, the probability itself is going to be the parameter. So, the sample space actually is going to be 0, 1, the interval 0, 1. Because this is a probability, this kind of take values beyond 0, 1. So, in this case, we are taking a probability, then we can assume that the maximum entropy distribution in the case of the ignorant agent that doesn't know anything else, is the one that is uh, giving us the possible values of this real probability, which is unknown to us. That's the point. This is unknown to us. We will know it. We don't know. But, but, if, if, but this curly calligraphic F is determined by the constraints. So. Yes, this calligraphic F is determined by the constraints. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the assumption that we are going to make for now. Okay, that this P is there. So. Then, in this case, this active information, which is determining in the end if uh, uh, the agent is increasing or decreasing its belief on fine tuning, is going to be given by the following ratio, well, P uh, over P0 of the same event. But notice that since P0 is actually, again, the maximum entropy distribution over 0, 1, then actually P0 of A is given by this uh, 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 bound that we have here. So the probability, the new probability of being uh, in the set A is delta. Or actually it's bounded about the delta. That new probability, so that's why this is less than equal to the denominator. And then the probability of A, the posterior probability, actually if P is in F, notice that actually the life permitting interval we can know that the life permitting interval is going to be bounded by this TP mass. Because in F, every element in F is bounded by the Turing probability, the maximum Turing probability. So I know that this posterior probability is going to, is going to be the minimum between the delta and TP mass and Y. And since we are assuming that actually uh, uh, delta is smaller that there is fine tuning, so it's Since we are assuming that there is fine tuning, this delta is small, and I can assume, well, I can prove actually, but I can't, that, that this delta is also going to be smaller than TP mass. So I can select the delta which is going to be smaller than TP mass. And under that assumption, then this becomes just the logarithm of one over TP mass. So that again, if TP mass is smaller than one in this case, I can prove that I have learned. Provided that this is true, of course, because 
this is the policy that I have found to that. Sorry, this is the statement that I have found to be. So notice then that remember that in order for learning, I would only need it. Just as circular as the other argument, isn't it? No. No, because in the end, remember that for learning, we need two features. For learning, we need this active information being bigger than zero on the one side. And on the other side, we uh, need that the actual the, the thing that we are looking at is true in the true world. So this is the situation. We are assuming it is true. So these are two orders of magnitude story. Oh, but then that, that we are not we are not claiming that. We are not claiming that the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations is actually functional and that we can learn it. But again, so we're assuming that something is fine tuned, and then we're deducing that we can learn that it is fine tuned. Yes, because we don't know if it is fine tuned. So, this is, this is, so we are saying this is true, but we don't know it. Okay? And then we are going to apply our criteria. That's what we are saying. And then the criteria is going to be put into the setting of learning and knowledge in order to see if we are learning uh, knowing something that we didn't learn or know it or knew before. That's what we're doing. Okay? So again, we have the criteria and then we are putting that criteria inside the learning uh, uh, setting in order to see if we are actually learning something. So remember that learning again required that the proposition is true, which in this case is and the, the logarithm is. We don't need to know it for the right reasons in order for, uh, uh, we don't need to know it for the right reasons. Because in that case, we would have acquired knowledge. This is enough for learning. And if this TP max is smaller than one, in some case, then we can say that actually, we can learn that the parameter is fine to life in this case. Now, it is very interesting. We still kind of need an oracle, don't we? Because this torus of magnitude example is false. Yeah. But TP max is less than one. Yeah. But we don't know. We, we, we don't think it. So we, we don't know that we can learn. We don't know that we can learn. But in that case, then it's false. So in that case, but it's we false. Don't know, but we exactly. don't know. But in that case, it's false, so we are not learning. Because the requirement for learning is that it is true. It's a kind of amusing. It's kind of it's wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is this, this becomes interesting because actually, if you ask me, I'm trying to generate a connection between this again and the desirability. Yeah. Particularly true. because the knowing the knowing criteria is too strong. It's a I totally that, that, that is Which is the same thing that happens in undesirability. Yeah. Undesirability and uh, 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 incompleteness are self-referential single proofs, mm -hmm. basically. By construction, so yeah, this is uh, this is why actually I want to go into that direction because I think there is a close connection between the two. But then, just to finish, because with with this I finished, I can remove this assumption in order to learn. This assumption is only needed to construct p, but in the end, I only need that tp mass is smaller than one and that this is true. But if I want to say that I, uh, if I want to acquire knowledge about that constant being fine tuning, then this thing must be true. Because if not, I kind of justify my true belief. And then in that case, I kind of say that uh, I uh, know uh, that that constant is fine tuned for that. So, yeah, I will stop. I will stop here. There are many open questions that we still have, many open research challenges with this problem, with this program. But, yeah, I will stop there.